I am Henrique Bueno, CEO and founder of Hobin Institute Brazil. I am so happy that you are watching this masterclass and hope to see you soon on the course The Choice to be Happy, where we will explore evidence-based practices and activities designed to elevate the five dimensions of the SPIRE model toward more spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional well-being. I am thrilled to be at your side in this journey. So let's go. Today, I want to start off with a personal question. What is your biggest dream? A dream you have now, you probably always have had, and surely will always have. If you are a parent, I will make things a little bit easier for you. What is the only dream you have for your children? You know, when I ask this question to large audiences in keynotes and workshops, often enough, someone will raise a hand and say that their biggest dream is, for instance, to buy a beautiful house on the beach or a nice new car. You know, I have always been passionate about the art and the science of coaching. And, as you know, coaches love to ask questions. So, I can help myself and I always reply with another question. Excellent, I say. But when you finally have your beautiful house on the beach, what will then change in your life? Commonly enough, the person will tell me that he will have more leisure time with his family and will be able to travel more often. Like every good coach, however, I really love to ask my questions. So I will ask again, excellent, but tell me, when you have your beautiful house on the beach and start enjoying more leisure time and traveling with your family, what will then change in your life? At this point, most people start to get a little bit annoyed and will probably tell me something like they will feel more at peace and will enjoy a healthier lifestyle by watching the sun rise every morning while taking a nice walk on the sand. But as you probably know, good coaches are sometimes a pain. They really love their questions. And I will keep on asking, tell me then, when you have all of that while enjoying that amazing sunrise, what will then change really in your life? You will agree with me that at some point, this person will probably reply by saying that when the house dream comes to fruition, then he will be happier. After that, I can ask anything, but I can guarantee you that there won't come any other answer. The truth is that our biggest dream is to live a happy life. As a father, of course, I most certainly want my three beautiful young boys to be good and successful, to make a lot of money in amazing careers, to have great relationships, and to give me many grandchildren. But diving deeper, what I really want is for them to be happy, believing that those achievements will lead them to it. Even though the grandchildren part is probably what I want to make my older version a happy granddad. What I really want for them, as you surely want for your children and for yourself, is a happy life. The big problem, however, is that many of us, at least at some point in life, begin to live what I usually call the great game of life. I borrowed that name from a board game I used to play when I was a kid. In this real game of life, however, we sometimes forget the rules and even the reasons why we are playing. We just keep blindly running at an unending rat race towards more and more productivity, more results and achievement, and forget completely why we want those things in the first place. This is how most of us learned to live our lives. This is how I used to live my life not too long ago. I lived the highest point of my successful career of almost 10 years as an executive in a legal department of one of the largest consumer goods companies in the world. I managed a large team, had a millionaire budget in my hands, took care of the entire labor system, labor operations of the company in Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay. I earned a very good salary, had a very pompous status, and was used to getting an incredible bonus every year in company shares. Anyone who looked from the outside was sure that my life was won, that everything was perfect, and that I had nothing to complain about. 
My team was excellent and we delivered incredible results every year. I lived in a nice apartment and went on foot to work, which makes a lot of a difference in Sao Paulo. I was respected within my area of expertise and had a very positive expectation of continuing to grow in my career. But what we see from the outside doesn't always say much. Inside, I knew something was missing, something was very wrong. I spent more than 10 hours working every day, being pushed, actually mostly pushing myself to deliver more, more and more. I faced absurd pressure to deliver more and more results. I didn't allow myself to make any mistakes and lived from crisis to crisis, which often enough affected how I slept, ate and took care of my body and mind. I had married the woman of my life, Manu, but when I got home, I had barely any energy left for a good conversation. And if I had the energy, the mood and patience was long gone. As we lay down to bed, my wife fell asleep reading some interesting blog on her cell phone and I spent hours answering emails or reviewing my unending to-do list for the next day. When we woke up, we said good morning first to our smartphones. And depending on the news, email or message I received, I was already running out without even having a nice breakfast with my wife. Have you ever felt this way? A sense of being on autopilot, always running to do and do more, to get more. Feeling that you need to prove yourself all the time to show everyone that you are what they want you to be. We grow in our career, we get more money and success, just to quickly target another goal always ahead. Evidence suggests that many of us, the majority, I dare to say, live an un unengaged life, a rat race toward growth and achievement that usually only leads toward more social comparison and new far-fetched goals. A life where even high achievement, money and success often enough do not come accompanied by the happiness we all dream about. And that is why I'm so happy that you are here, because together we will navigate through a new science that can direct you, as it directed me, toward a different type of life, a happier life. Before we move forward, I have to ask you another question. What are some of the myths you carry in regards to happiness? What are some beliefs you hold deep within you that you kind of know they will not really bring the happiness you dream of? Before we move any further, it's important that we bring these myths to the surface, for they might be blocking your path towards a happier life. Can you think about some of these myths? In my experience teaching this topic, the first myth that probably came to your mind is the common belief that money brings happiness. And you probably are hearing in your head many conflicting voices right now, such as, well, money does not bring true happiness, except if it is a lot of money, right? Can you acknowledge the fact that most of us have this ingrained idea that money, at least a lot of it, is a solution to happiness? Deep down, we all believe, even on a, on a subconscious level, that more money will most certainly lead to more happiness. If you are not there yet, it's because you have not yet got the salary you need. But sit down and listen to this. The bulk of evidence from countless studies has shown that there is no causal relationship between money and happiness. In other words, more money does not lead to more happiness. The only exception, of course, is when more money is needed to provide for basic needs. For instance, if a person has not proper housing, food, clothing, more money can most certainly lead to a sustainable increase in happiness and well-being. But after basic needs are met, more money is not causal to more happiness. One of the fathers of the science of happiness, which we will dive into during this course, Professor Mihaly Cistek Mihal from Claremont University, has once asked the following question, if we are so rich, why aren't we happy? In his article, he has shown that despite the tremendous increase in material possession and comfort of American families over the past decades, there has been no real increment in their happiness levels. On the contrary, even though earning much more and living a much more comfortable life, one that technologies such as Alexa or Siri can turn your favorite music when you arrive at home and suggest your favorite new TV show, levels of depression, anxiety, obesity, 
and even suicide have grown considerably. Money can and most certainly brings a passing state of euphoria. We all have felt that. But how long does it last? Do you want me to prove my point? Okay, consider this. Imagine that you work alongside your best friend. Let's call her Susan just for the sake of this exercise. Now imagine that you and Susan are the exact same age, student the exact same major in the same college, and with the same exact credentials started to work in the same organization on the same day, to earn the same exact salary, and to perform the same identical tasks. And you both sit together, one in front of the other. Can you picture that image? Now imagine that on a normal, uneventful day, a simple Tuesday for instance, you arrive at work to find a post-it note on your computer, your boss telling you that she wants to see you right away. With a rush of adrenaline, you go to her office. She then tells you that since you are an invaluable employee and since you perform so well, she has decided to give you a raise. That from this Tuesday on, you will have a 20% increase in salary. How happy are you when you leave her room? You are ecstatic, right? Of course you are. But now imagine that when you approach Susan, you notice before telling her your great news, that her smile is a little bit broader than yours. You then decide to ask her what's going on. She tells you that she has just come back from your boss's office with an amazing news, that she got a 35% raise. My question to you is simple. Where has your happiness gone? Of course you're happy for your dear friend, but is your 20% raise bringing you the same happiness it brought two minutes before? Is there any change? Some confusion, perhaps? We have all faced something like that. You feel a high when you, say, buy that brand new car, but often enough, you lose interest as soon as the smell of the leather seat fades away. That takes us to two more myths. The myths of happiness as a destination and of stable, perpetual feeling of happiness. Let me share with you another personal story. Quite a few years ago, when I was the legal director of that company I told you, I used to tell all my colleagues that because I was young and full of energy, I would work as hard as I could. For one day, I would save some money, buy a nice ranch on the countryside, and then, oh then, then I would be happy. And I did that. I saved some money and I bought that ranch. Not just a ranch, but a ranch in a beautiful city on the seaside in the middle of the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil. I remember going to the local hardware store one day to negotiate a discount to build my house. And the owner, a nice man called Gerson, said the following, how nice you bought a ranch. You know that this ranch will give you two happy moments, right? The first is now, because you bought it. The next will be when you sell it. I confess to you that at that time, I thought Gerson was completely crazy. I could only see the green leaves, the flowers, the, uh, the birds around me. I could only feel the soft breeze and the smell and aroma of the grass after the rain. But after a short while, weeks, I dare to say, all this apparent unending happiness it started to fade away to worry and tiredness. All I could see now was how hard it was to keep it all organized, how quickly I had to once again cut the grass and so forth. Believing that happiness happens only on a specific destination and that getting there will bring you a fixed and constant state of joy and bliss is another big myth. The truth is that we are extremely adaptable. We get used to things and people in a process we call hedonic adaptation. Researcher Sonia Lubomirsky, the author of the bestseller book, The Myths of Happiness, explains that we all have what she calls a set point of happiness. The set point, to some extent, is determined by our biology. Some of us have a high set point that moves us more toward happiness, while others have a lower set point. The ups and downs of life take us higher or lower, but after some time, we tend to go back to our regular set point. Truth be told, according with my teacher, Dr. Tal ben Shahar from Harvard, there are only two types of people that do not experience the highs and lows of life. Can you guess who they are? Yep, the dead and the psychopaths. So yes, if you're not one of those people, you probably do experience and will remain to experience the ups 
and the downs of life. There is no happy ever after go to aim for. Happiness is not the same thing as joy, which is a mere fleeting emotion. Happiness is, according to researcher Sonia Lubimirsky, the experience of pleasurable emotions such as joy, gratitude, or combined with a sense that one's life is worthwhile and full of meaning. It is not enough, however, just to feel good. One needs to evaluate he, his or her own life in a positive way too, which makes happiness much more than just the search for pleasure, therefore a much higher aspiration. Why is it so difficult to live a happy life? What is going on with the world that so many of us are currently suffering from an unprecedented mental health crisis? Shouldn't we, by now, know what to do in order to live a good life? Well, as you may imagine, happiness is one of the oldest subjects of humanity. Eastern and Western philosophies and religions have, from the beginning of our history, been interested in, in this subject. The problem was that psychology, the science in general, and psychology in particular, for a long time in its history, decided to focus its attention almost exclusively to understand what did not work in individuals, relationships, organizations, and communities. In other words, psychology dedicated itself almost exclusively to understanding pathology. Researchers wanted to understand why people got sick, why so many suffered from mental health issues, why some couples didn't work well together, and decided for a divorce. Why and how panic, anxiety, and depression took place, why some children had difficulty in learning. The main objective of these studies were to help individuals, couples, communities to come back to normality. The focus on what's not working and pathology has always been and will always be important. If you have faced depression or have known somebody that did, you most certainly acknowledge how important it is for science to dedicate itself to finding ways to treat such a devastating disease. The big problem, however, which a few researchers realized at the end of the last century, is that focus only on what's not working is not enough. In other words, the absence of disease is not health. One can be without disease and yet be not thriving. If our aim is potential, if our dream is to live the happiest possible life, we need to do more than just understand why and how things are not working well. Let me demonstrate my point. Imagine that you decide to sit down with a child with all kinds of colorful materials around you, sheets of paper of various textures and color, glue, sticks of many shapes and sizes, paint, to teach these children 10 ways to make a kite that will not fly. The child, for one hour or so, is immersed in the experience and learns a lot from you. Imagine now that after all this time, you ask the same children to you, using the same material still available, to make a kite that will fly. What do you think will happen? Do you think the child, after learning from you these 10 ways not to make a proper kite, will be able to make one that does? The answer is most certainly no. The child might eventually find out how, but not because of what she learned from you. In other words, the more we learn about what doesn't work, the more we understand it. But we do not learn anything about the opposite, the positive experience that also exists. The focus on pathology aims to return to the expected average, while the focus on the positive can lead us to the exploration of our few full potential. Traditional psychology knows perfectly well what happens to the brain of an individual in depression, or to couples who are getting ready for a divorce, or even to organizations that do not prosper. But what about the other extreme? Why are some people so resilient in face of the same adversities that we all live? Why do some couples live so well together despite the hardships of any relationship? Let me bring you a personal example. My dear grandfather, after a 70-year-long marriage with his only girlfriend at age 90, used to wake up every day at 4.55 a.m. One day, I decided to talk with him and I asked, Grandpa, why do you do that? Why not rest a little longer? Do you know what he replied to me? Why, I can't. You know, your grandma wakes up at 5 a.m. and I want to welcome her with her usual cup of coffee and a ritual 
morning kiss. I don't know about you, but this is the kind of marriage I want to have with Manu. I want, as I believe all of us do, to live my life to its fullest potential, to flourish instead of only being well enough. I want my children to live the full potential of their lives also. And if potential is what you aspire to, we need to completely change the focus of the questions we have been asking ourselves. This is the positive psychology revolution, which formally started in 1998 when Professor Martin Seligman from the University of Pennsylvania urged his fellow researchers about this need. In his public address as the new president of the American Psychology Association. Since then, in this brief history of a bit more than 20 years, the field of psychology has faced a major shift from a focus exclusively on pathology to openness to also understanding the positive or what goes well with people, organizations, communities, um, couples. A recent longitudinal study shows that since the early 90s, the number of publications in professional journals with this revised focus toward the positive has exponentially increased. Note that the whole objective is not to ignore the problems, diseases, or negative aspects of reality. It's simply not to ignore the positive or, in a way, to level up the scale so both realities can be objectively understood and analyzed. The so-called science of happiness, although very recently, continues to grow and is already in all spheres of society, from the individual level to organization, communities, schools, and even governments. According to Yuval Harari in his brilliant work Homo Deus, the pursuit of happiness has become and will remain one of the most important drivers of humanity. At this stage, however, many people ask me, what is the difference between positive psychology and the self-help movement? Wouldn't it be the same thing, they wonder? In fact, they are quite different, and I will explain that showing the two major differences between them both. First, if you, like me, have read and like self-help books, you have probably realized by now that most times, despite really enjoying the reading after the book ends, hardly any change occurs in your lives. The reason for that is that most of the self-help teachings are based on the individual experience of the author on a personal level or during his or her experience as a CEO, a coach, or a father, for example. The author did something that worked for him, so he writes a book to teach his findings, his method. The problem is, however, that the fact that it worked for him does not mean that we work for us. As all of the self-help fans have probably realized, positive psychology, on the other hand, rests on the scientific method of research, which is designed and approved by ethics commissions of major universities and institutions and follows strict rules, such as the use of control groups, as well as predefined measurements and statistics. As a result, findings are much more likely to serve the broad public if the same conditions present in this study are applicable at the specific case. But there's a second important difference, which has actually something to do with the name of the book. Most of the self-help books I know offer a promise. Think and get rich, or the five habits, or even the secret. Positive psychology does not work with promises or secrets. Quite the contrary, instead of trying to show people a unique way to solve all problems, positive psychology is based on life's experience as it is, understanding that good and bad things happen all the time. Its findings and interventions are therefore designed to help us live better through regular practices and actions without ignoring the negative of our life as it is. During the five weeks of the course, the choice to be happy, I will talk about the science of happiness and I will introduce you to the SPIRE model of whole person well-being. And we will explore and practice evidence-based tools and activities designed to elevate the five dimensions of well-being in your life. The spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational and emotional dimensions. I can't wait to start this journey with you.